So we'll move on to the next speaker of the symposium, and it's a pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Ashish Jain. Uh, he is a professor in the Department of Transfusion Medicine in the Postgraduate Institute of Medical <coughs> Education and Research, PGI Chandigarh, and uh, he will be sharing with us uh, about the transfusion support in uh, cellular therapy. So, Dr. Ashish, please, and you have about 15 minutes plus two minutes for this question as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. A very good morning to all of you. So I would be talking on transfusion support in cellular therapy. So at the outset, uh, first I would like to thank the organizer to keep this topic in this uh, wide uh, range of uh, cellular aspects, which is like uh, transfusion is generally left out and like a lot of patients undergo hematopoietic stem cell transplant and we usually talk about uh, their outcomes, their survival and all. But like uh, as a laboratory support to these patients, we need to uh, discuss about a lot of strategies by which many blood products are, be are being transfused to these patients. So in these few slides, I would just uh, try to cover up the basic aspects of the transfusion support to these patients and how do we decide about the strategies, what products to be transfused in various phases of transplant. So as we know that hematopoietic stem cell transplant is primarily uh, used to treat a variety of hematological as well as congenital diseases and uh, we know the advantage is like pluripotent, pluripotent early committed hematopoietic progenitor cells. They actually lack the ABO antigens. So the engraftment of progenitor cells is not inhibited even if there are circulating anti-A or anti-B antibodies. So this advantage we can exploit and we can easily go across the ABO barrier while we talk of hematopoietic stem cell transplant. But there are some discrepancies between donors and patients and some complications arising out of transfusion support to these patients. So where we have to actually look into the blood groups and what product has to be selected. And as we know, the primary thing for this uh, survival, which decides about the survival or engraftment of, for these patients is the HLA match. And it keeps the balance between the potential harm from GVHD as well as the benefit from graft versus leukemia effect. And if we look at the data worldwide, HLA matched allogenic stem cell donors have still some degree of ABO incompatibility and now it is to the tune of 25 to 50% in those transplantations. However, as when we look at the data, there are very few control trials, in fact, very scanty of them, which actually assess the transfusion practice in this group of patients. And mostly these trials are based on efficacy of the procedures or the survival outcomes. So if we look at the role of transfusion service or the blood transfusion service in any center, it is like, it, it is multidimensional because it is like a vein to vein connection. So it can help recruiting donors for the registries. So you can have a registry of donors and it evaluates the eligibility and suitability of the donors. At the same time, it provides services to the patients as well, like in product collecting, processing, by aferesis technology, other cellular therapy products like granulocyte infusions, donor lymphocyte infusions. And at the same time, since these patients are knockout, have knockout bone marrow, so you, they are in continuous need of various blood components like packed RBCs, platelets, granulocyte, plasma. So we provide a lot of transfusion support to these patients. So if we look at the compatibility issues, if we look at the basic blood group system, we have O, A, B, and AB. And if the, these, the donors and patients, if they are identical, it's a complete match with respect to ABO. But if there are discrepancies or differences, it could be a major or minor or bidirectional incompatibility. So when we say major, that means the recipient has already pre-existing antibodies against the red cell antigen which is exposed to him by way of donor graft. And when we come to minor incompatibility, that means the donor, that is the graft product, has antibodies against the recipient 
red blood cell antigens. And when we talk of bidirectional, that means it's both ways. Like the classical example is A to B or B to A. And what are the implications of these incompatibilities? Like in major, if we see, the major problem is the acute hemolytic episode, which can actually go to a severe level and it could result from transfusion of incompatible RBCs. At the same time, if there are pre-existing antibodies, then there could be a delay in RBC engraftment. And in severe cases, it can lead to pure red cell aplasia. And there could be also delay in granulocyte and platelet engraftment. So how to prevent this? Like, what's the problem is like the pre-existing antibodies there against the donor RBC. So you can think of reducing the RBC load of the product. Or you can think of doing a removal of these antibodies in the recipient. That is by a therapeutic plasma exchange. But again, these are not so simple procedures because like if you try to reduce the red cell from the product, you can have a risk of losing the progenitor cells, which is the stem cell in the graft. Similarly, in minor, the problem encountered is different. Like you, the patient can still have acute hemolytic episode and it could be due to uh, elevated ABO antibody titers in the donor's plasma. And another risk is, which is very, uh, I mean, severe problem, like it is the passenger lymphocyte syndrome, which I'll talk in the next slide as well. So it is basically due to the passenger lymphocytes which make their way in the donor graft and they start producing ABO antibodies according to the blood group of the donor. And in case of bidirectional, both these problems exist and it becomes even more challenging. So if you look at the various phases of transplant where these problems are encountered, it can be spread over three phases classically, the phase one, phase two, and the phase three. So phase one starts right from the pre-transplantation stage when the patient is identified as a candidate for the transplant. And the phase two is the peritransplantation or the transplantation phase when the patient starts receiving chemotherapy or irradiation and it also includes the infusion of the graft till the time engraftment occurs which spread over around two to four weeks of time. And the delayed phase or the phase three, the post engraftment phase where the direct pump stress is negative and the recipient antibodies or the RBCs are no longer detect detectable. Everything is of the donor type when everything is taken over by the marrow. So this is the actual transplantation phase or the post-transplant phase. So this is a table which appears to be quite complex, but in simple terms, when we talk of transfusion support, we have to take this as a basic guideline for selecting the blood group unit to be transfused to the recipients, both in terms of red cells, platelets, and plasma. So when we talk of major, minor, and bidirectional incompatibilities, the components in the phase one, that is in the pre-transplant phase, what we can like visualize is like everything should be of the recipient type. But when the patient has received the transplant or the graft, what you can remember is like the packed cell should be of the recipient type, that is the patient type. And the platelet and plasma components could be of the donor type because these are containing primarily the antibodies. So this could be true in case of major incompatibility. And in the phase three, whether it is major, minor, or bidirectional, everything could be of the donor type because ultimately it's the donor type which takes up the marrow and the patient starts producing the donor type of red cells, platelets, and plasma, everything. But in case of minor, it, it becomes vice versa. So in the initial phase, it is okay to be recipient type, but in case of red cells, since it's a minor, you can switch over to the donor type because these donor type antigens, when transfused to the recipient, they don't have any uh, even antibodies. If they're there in the recipient, they are not going to harm the donor type red cells. So you can switch over to donor type, but for plasma and platelets components, since they bear the antibodies primarily, so it has to be the recipient time. So this is a, like uh, at a glance chart for deciding about the which blood group product has to be taken up for transfusion 
to various recipients in different phases of transplant. So when we talk of antibodies, we just really come across anti-A, anti-B antibodies. But if you look at the red cell blood group system, there are more than 36 blood group systems uh, and which produce more than 300 antigens. So we have to take care of these also if they are found to be clinically significant. So we have come across patients where they have developed either anti-KID, M, and S, Lewis antibodies, the RH antibodies besides the anti-D antibodies. So overall prevalence is around 1 to 8.6 percent worldwide. And the various factors lead to this uh, allo immunization or production of these antibodies, like the primary being the donor-derived lymphocytes, the recipient lymphocytes, which are actually resistant to conditioning regimen, the recipient age, the conditioning regimen use, and actually the secretor status of the donor and recipient, because all these antigens are produced in the plasma also as free antigens. So the main problem with the major ABO incompatibility is the risk of pure red cell aplasia, which is by definition uh, persistent reticulocytopenia beyond 60 days time and absence of RBC precursors in the bone marrow aspirate. And it can, the incidence is again variable from 6 to 30 percent and primarily the lymphocytes which are viable in the donor graph, they are surviving and they survive the myeloablation and these start producing antibodies to the transplanted donor derived red cells and early it could be early or late also so the recipient antibodies destroy these erythroid precursors although not the stem cells but the precursors do have these antigens which leads to anemia and the patient is then put on regular red cell transfusion it usually resolves within week or months time but the recovery depends on a lot of factors like the titers of antibodies, the quantity of target antigen available and the rate of clearance of these antibodies, presence of GVSD or not and of course the transplantation regimen which is being used. So the primarily management lies in the removal of these antibodies like by plasma exchange as I told but again it is not always fruitful. When it comes to minor incompatibility, the biggest risk is passenger lymphocyte syndrome or the PLS. So there could be a transient hemolysis even if donor-derived lymphocytes, they make their way in the viable HCT graph and they form blood group specific antibodies. Suppose say a recipient is group A and the donor is group O. So this group O donor graft will have viable lymphocytes which will produce anti-A and anti-B antibodies. And this anti-A antibodies in the recipient can lead to destruction of red cell precursors and the mature red cells which are of group A type which may persist for some time. So it again usually present within 5 to 15 days of transplant and may persist for a week to 10 days and the, we have to actually just monitor the hemolysis and decide accordingly the transfusion support to the patient and the risk factors being the more the CD19 cells, the lymphocytes in the graft, so PBSC grafts have a higher risk than the bone marrow graft and non-HLA matched siblings again have more risk. So what we need to do is continuously monitor the patient for blood counts, the hemolytic evidence that is bilirubin, LDH, and of course the direct antiglobulin test, which is actually the first indicator of such problem. So this is a case example where a patient after transplant, he actually developed on day eight and nine, you can see in the graph, a severe fall in hemoglobin. So this was due to massive hemolysis caused by anti-A antibodies which was produced by, in the recipient by the donor derived lymphocytes since the donor was from group O. So this group O derived donor lymphocytes, they tend to produce anti-A as well as anti-B antibodies. So it leads to destruction of this A red cell bearing red, uh, antigens. What we can do for prevention is, as I told, plasma reduction could be done in the product, but again, it's not so efficient method and, and immunosuppressant like rituximab can be given and a pre-transplant red cell exchange could be considered, but again, it's not so effective.
So for monitoring purpose, we keep on monitoring the hemoglobin levels, reticulocyte, and the anti-A, anti-B titers for which the transfusion facility has to be very alert. It should be at least weekly and begin at least day four post-transplant. And if the recipient transplant titers before the procedure itself is very high, like it's 128 or above, then we have to actually monitor it twice weekly until the titers go down to 16 and we can switch back to weekly monitoring when they disappear. And the follow-up is continuously until they are undetectable for at least two consecutive weeks. Once the engraftment occurs, means it's, a, it's considered as a positive outcome, but again the times are variable and criteria are different. But during this engraftment phase, most of the patients, they are need, in need of RBC, platelet, or other blood component support. So platelet engraftment is by definition uh, more than 20,000 per microliter count for three consecutive days. Similarly, RBC, when you see 1% reticulocyte in the peripheral blood and the neutrophil engraftment is very important. That is absolute neutrophil count, more than 500 microliter for three consecutive days. Again, this is influenced by many factors like patient-donor relationship, the dose of CD34 cells, and of course the stem cell source. The early engraftment is more common with apheresis products. And of course the patient-to-patient -patient variability do occur. So if you look at the studies, why we are like so much concerned about major ABO incompatibility. So although there are no much, not much of control trials, but most of the studies have found a variable result with respect to ABO incompatibility. And as you can see in this compilation, man, many studies in major, uh, Ashish, minor, uh, as well as bi-direction. I'll just wind up in two minutes. Okay, thank you. So there are no consensus world over. So ABO incompatibility does not have a consistent effect. So that's why more and more transplant are being considered in spite of being ABO incompatible. So similarly, the study says this. So I'll just you know, quickly go through the various components which we are using for our transfusion support. So packed RBC support is consistently required. Hemoglobin threshold is usually seven gram, but in sick patient, it could be eight grams. And if in these patients, the erythropoietin levels is generally decreased leading to anemia. Sometimes we face problem with these antibodies because if the patients have these antibodies, we have to look for antigen negative blood like the Kel antigen, E antigen, Kid B antigen. So these are the rare ones and you really need to work out and do a calculation for probability of finding a matched antigen matched red cell. Similarly for platelets, uh, there are many strategies developed, but the transfusion threshold is generally considered either 10,000 or 20,000, depends on the uh, center to center practice. But mostly prophylactic transfusion strategies, the evidence is clinically lacking. So it's not very straight or clear that whether prophylactic transfusion should be used. And many trials have shown that that selecting platelet dose for patients based on their surface area is more critical rather than the number of transfusions. So this is how we calculate the platelet response because platelet refractoriness is a very frequent problem where the count or the corrected count increment is less than 7500 and which is calculated by this formula. And many immune and non-immune causes, as you have seen in this list, are responsible for it. But when we come across any immune cause, what we try to do is HLA matched and cross match compatible platelets are given to these patients. And you can also use leukoreduced blood components, as I'll show in the next slide, like plasma platelets, besides platelets like plasma cryo are also sometimes required, but the gen indications are generally the same as for other patients. And another important product for these patients is granulocyte, which is frequently required for this patients because especially if there is a severe febrile neutropenia, we may have to go for these transfusions. And it's again collected by apheresis from a donor after GCSF stimulation. And it has to be transfused within six hours because the shelf life is again just 24 hours. And we have to be sure that the product is irradiated because we need to get away with these lymphocytes. 
Why? Because these lymphocytes can cause transfusion associated graft versus host disease. Besides these, we produce a or we prepare a large special components like washed red cell components for patients having allergic reactions and leukoreduced blood components. The advantages like it prevents refractoriness, especially the platelets. So it's the biggest advantage besides HLA aluminization. So we need to leukoreduce them using leukofilters and the criteria is less than 5 into 10 raised to power 6 WBCs per unit. Similarly, we also prepare irradiated units just to avoid this TAGVSD by using irradiation through gamma rays because this is a very fatal disease. So preventive measure is the best one because the, as you can see in this chart, the mortality rates are quite high, 90 to 100%. So we ensure that all these patients receive irradiated products right from the transplantation stage till maybe up to one year of transplant. And for pediatric patients, we try, like for Thal major, we try to give a phenotype mask for other minor red cell antigens also right from the beginning. And these are the parameters which actually guide hemolysis. So as I told, that is the most important test which will indicate the ongoing hemolysis for which causes could be immune or non-immune. And this is a small data from our center where I just want to highlight that like continuous serological testing is very important because you can, at one stage, you can find a mixed field reaction. Means you'll find red cells both from donors as well as patients. The grouping won't be corroborative. So there you have to actually decide which blood group you should select to avoid any hemolysis in the recipient. So this becomes very critical. So as I told, uh, weekly monitoring is a must in these patients. This is another study from India where they have shown that in 100 recipients who underwent hematopoietic stem cell transplant, the transfusion requirements were more in mud transplant as compared to mass related donors. And also in cases of major and bi-directional transplant, the number of blood component transfused was significantly higher than the other groups. So I would like to conclude with this uh, transfusion support in, ther in cellular therapy by emphasizing that these patients require considerable number of blood component support in all phases of transplant. So we need a overall strategy for clinical as well as laboratory management, especially for ABO incompatible ones. And it's right from the beginning when the recipient is selected from transplant, we try to tie up with the clinician who is planning for the transplant along with the donor so that everything is checked, all these antibodies, antigens are assessed prior, and it will help as a guide for deciding about the selection of blood components for these recipients throughout the transplantation stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ashish. Uh, uh, we have time only for one question, and uh, is there any question? Uh, this is my close friend. He's a blood relative. Yes. Uh, we work, uh, both of us work in the same field. I just uh, want to ask you one single question. Um, what is the quantum of blood support uh, given to the patient in different uh, types of cellular therapy? I think you, you, you might have only told about uh, a bone marrow transplant. Yeah. There are many other uh, yeah, actually, forms. Actually, at our center, the primarily, because like, this cellular therapy is still coming up. And the primary domain of transfusion support is actually required in hematopoietic stem cell transplant only. And it's still like gaining importance. And initially, we were doing only for uh, hemato-oncology cases. But uh, when the program began, as uh, Dr. Pankaj will share many things about our center in the next uh, talk of his, uh, means like majority of them initially were autologous one, but then gradually we shifted to allogenic ones also. And these were mainly the adult patients. So largely our experience is with uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant only and not other cellular therapy procedures. Thank you. 